Why do this review? Why do a review of a super tweeter? Well, let's back up the tape. <laughs> let's back up the tape for just a moment. So I'm looking at the Aperion Audio website, and I see that they have three, count them, three super tweeters. They have a $350 one, they have a $1,000 super tweeter, and they have this one, the Aluminum Ribbon Super Tweeter Mark II, which is $650. Bucks. I'm intrigued that they could make, that they would want to make three super tweeters. There must be a market for them to make that kind of commitment. And they've been making these for a while now. And I'm looking closer and I see that this, this the aluminum ribbon super tweeter is a true ribbon tweeter. It's not a folded ribbon tweeter. It's not an air motion transformer tweeter. No, those are pretty common. You see them all the time now. But a true ribbon tweeter. It's kind of like the tweeter that was in my MagnaPan 3.7s. In other words, it's a, it's a super thin ribbon in a magnetic field. No constraints. Neodymium magnets, solid, encased in a steel structure inside a beautifully finished, I think it's an MDF case. Very beautiful. It's transformers, caps, it's all first class. Very nicely done. Now, its sensitivity as a speaker, because it is a little speaker, it's a passive unit, is 96 dB sensitivity, meaning that I couldn't use it with my clipses. You have to use it with speakers that are 96 dB sensitivity or less. So we're just going to head that off right at the pass. And of course, matching it with any speaker is, is not necessarily the easiest thing to do and not necessarily uh, a sure thing. So luckily enough, you, when you buy this from Aperion Audio, you have a 30-day return privilege, which I would say is absolutely mandatory to buy something like this because you don't know if it's going to work. You just don't know. And it's going to take some time for you to figure it out, by the way, if it's going to work. And by the way, it does come with a three-year warranty. So when I set out to do this review, I had uh, a bunch of speakers in mind that I was going to try it with, starting with the speaker that I just reviewed recently, which is the Dynaudio Emit 30. Now the Emit 30 has a terrific tweeter, a really, really, really first class tweeter. So the question is, why would you use a super tweeter with a, with a, with a speaker that has a great tweeter in the first place? That was sort of the premise, the reason to do a review like this was matching a super tweeter with a, with a speaker that already has a great tweeter. And I also used it with uh, the Kef LS50. And I also used it with the ELAC Unify Reference, which is one of my references. And last but not least, the Graham LS6. Those were the four speakers. I couldn't do it with every speaker, but those were the speakers that were different enough from each other that it made sense to do these comparisons. Oh, and of course, don't worry, guys, there will be an audiophiliac viewer system of the day. The back of the speaker actually has crossover controls, high-pass crossover controls for 8 kilohertz, 10, 12, 14, and 16 kilohertz and also attenuation. So you can either run it wide open, meaning no attenuation, or minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, or minus five dB. Now, of course, your speaker sensitivity number, whatever its spec is, is, is not a literal thing. So you have to experiment when you're setting the sensitivity. The whole thing of adjusting those two knobs and making it work, that the, the tweeter work with your speaker is, is a guessing game, really. You could use the numbers as a starting point, and then you're just going to listen, and I'll talk about that further on in the review. And then, of course, below the two knobs are the input jacks. So I'm going to show you now how I hooked up the, speaker, the, the tweeter to the speaker. In this case, I'm going to show you the back of the Graham LS6 and how the wires went from the LS6 connectors up to 
the Aperion tweeter. So one detail I have to report, I'm duty bound to report, is that the aluminum ribbon super tweeter Mark II is made in China. Okay, so at this point I decided that I was going to match up the uh, Aperion aluminum ribbon super tweeter Mark II with some speakers, four speakers, but it had to, it had to be, it had to start with the Dyn Audio Emit 30. Well, mostly because I just spent a lot of time with that speaker because I just reviewed it and because the Mid 30s tweeter is so, so good. Great tweeter. Which would beg the question, if it's such a great tweeter, why would you use a super tweeter? It was a difficult test, intentionally difficult. So then I continued to adjust the controls with the high pass going up to 16K, going down to 12K, to 10K, to 8K, where it definitely was very, very audible. But the 12K, 14K high pass positions definitely seem to be the sweet spot with this speaker and pretty much all the speakers that I use. That much was clear. And similarly with all of the uh, speakers, for attenuation, I was at minus four, th minus three, minus four, minus five, pretty much. But anyway, I had the tweeter flush to the front of the Emit 30, but I did try just for fun moving it back an inch or two, and that was was audible, and it did not sound good. It sounded more well blurred. It just didn't make sense. Uh, I moved it back a little bit more, it got, it got worse, so it was just like, no, that's, that's not working. So I was back to being flush. And one of the nice things about this pairing of the Super Tweeter with the Mid-30 is the, the Mid-30's tweeter is right up, right near the top of the cabinet. So the Super Tweeter and the Mid's tweeter were very close to each other, and I think that may be why the pairing was as successful as, I, as, it, as it was. The other thing I learned is that you should be as close to the, your ears should be as close to the height of the super tweeter as possible. But in any case, um, you know, messing around with the controls, uh, and you're going to do that every time you change a recording, you go from one recording to the next, you're going to say, oh, I like it at 8K on this one, on this one, I like it at 10K, I want to turn it up, I want to turn it down, I want to turn it off. That's the sort of thing that happens. It's kind of like getting to live with a subwoofer, right? You're going to turn it up, you're going to turn it down, you're going to be adjusting the subwoofer's crossover control. It's a similar deal of learning to live with a super tweeter. That's what I learned is you don't just pop it in, adjust the controls, and you're done. So there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts going on here. So whether it's going to work in your room, with your speakers, you know, with in terms of the height that the tweeter is going to be on your speakers, these are all variables, right? That are very hard to pin down. Um, and your taste in music, and of course your hearing acuity. But remember, when it's set at 12K or 14K, it doesn't really start at 12K. There's a slope to it, so it's still putting out energy below 12K. It's a 12 dB per octave, so there's still energy coming out of the tweeter at 6K when it's at 12K. So you will definitely hear it at lower frequencies than the crossover setting. So hold steady, partners. Now, of course, if you play recordings that have nasty high frequencies, meaning a lot of heavily compressed pop recordings, what you're hearing may not be all that pleasant. Now, I played some, let's say, classic music, classic pop music, like um, Ziggy Stardust, and what I was getting, at least on some of the quieter tunes on Ziggy Stardust, was actually kind of cool in terms of what I heard around David Bowie's voice. I kind of liked, but when the band really gets going, and is, it, it got a bit much for me, and I wanted to turn the tweeter down the louder the music got, I'll put it that way. Same thing when I played um, the Alma Brothers Phil Maurice record. You know, on the quieter tunes, I was going, yeah, I can hear the, the acoustics of the Fillmore. It's really nice. I'm hearing space. I'm hearing depth. But then when the band really got going, nah, I didn't like it that much. Then when I played the Beach Boys 
Pet Sounds, the remaster by Mobile Fidelity on my Oppo BDP 105. Ah, that was a completely different story. First of all, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous recording. And with the super tweeter in, the harmonies, the vocals were just so beautiful. The space, the depth, everything just opened up more. And the orchestration, like the harpsichord, and even like the, I think the pedal bass, the definition, the clarity was incredible. So not just the high frequencies, everything was clear. The, the mid-range was clear. And then when I turned the tweeter off, the sound just lost some life. It got darker, more closed in without the tweeter. Remind you, this is with the Dynaudio Emit 30 speakers, which have, yes, terrific tweeter on their own. But once I immersed myself in listening with the super tweeter and got used to what it was bringing to the party with a great sounding recording like Pet Sounds and then put, taking it out, taking the super tweeter out, yeah, Super Tweeter was doing some good stuff. Next up, I tried the Super Tweeter with the ELAC Unify Reference. No slouch in any of these departments, um, but the Super Tweeter definitely opened up the sound more with good sounding recordings. That space, that detail, that clarity, especially on transient rich recordings. Um, with bright sounding recordings, uh, not so much. I wasn't so happy there. But with really good acoustic jazz, acoustic folk music, I liked what the Super Tweeter was doing on classical music. Yes, I liked it. With compressed pop music, no, I didn't like what the Super Tweeter was doing. So, or I could put it to you this way, I turned it down, the Super Tweeter's level down to minus five and turn the uh, high pass up to 16 kilohertz to minimize its contribution. And then it was, it was, it was good, depending on the recording, depending on the mix, et cetera, et cetera. With the, the Unify reference, I was, I was digging what the Super Tweeter was doing. But you gotta work with it. And that's the thing, it, it may not be one of those set and forget devices. But my time with the Super Tweeter was, was limited, you know, but I was determined to listen to the Super Tweeter with different speakers to just get a taste of what was, what was going on. Now I next moved on to the KEF LS50 Meta. That marriage wasn't working. The, the tweeters stood out like a sore thumb. I could not get it to blend. It just did not work. Because the thing is, the LS50 Meta just is so coherent by itself and so transparent by itself that adding the tweeter to it was just not just not going to happen. So that was in and out and in record time. Definitely. The last stop on the train for the aluminum ribbon super tweeter Mark II was with the Graham LS6. Now the Graham LS6 is a rather soft mellow, relaxed sounding speaker. A pipe and slippers speaker, as some people like to call this type of speaker. It's so beautiful. It's so easy to listen to. It's so gentle. So yeah, adding the super tweeter to that speaker was, it livened it up, right? Because it is lacking in detail, clarity, and air, and space, and all that other stuff, right? So in that sense, it transformed the sound of the LS6. It kind of made it into a different type of speaker. It was like adding salt to the food, right? It just made it jump more. And if, in other words, so if you don't own an LS6, but if you own a speaker that's kind of mellow and soft and relaxed, and you want it to, but you basically like it, but you wish it had more, more get up and go, so maybe what I'm saying here is that adding a super tweeter to a speaker that is already too mellow for you or you want to add some juice to it, it's a candidate for super tweeter. And as I said earlier, uh, Aperion offers three flavors of super tweeters, $350, this one $649, and also a $1,000 super tweeter. So your options are, are three, basically. 
Now, yeah, with the LS6, I found that um, dialing it in at 10K and 12K, it had more, more pizzazz to the sound, more life to it. And it was pretty easy to get it dialed in. And even with pop music, with <laughs> the Nationals record, I Am Easy to Find, is that what that record's called? Anyway, which is kind of an overly compressed, yet dark sounding record. Uh, I like the music, I really like the National, but I'm not too crazy about the sound of most of their recordings. And yeah, that record just it put it over the threshold from like, I don't really want to hear it to, I'm digging it over um, these Graham LS6s with the Super Tweeter. That combination just made that music more fun to listen to. It was the same deal in jazz, like with this Bill Evans trio recording really nice on its own without a super tweeter over the LS6. Just lovely, a lovely, lovely recording, beautiful speakers. I didn't need the super tweeter to enjoy the music. I did not. Adding the super tweeter, the bass definite, it's interesting that the bass definition was a little faster into the, the fingers on string sound, the cymbals, the snare came through clearer. And of course, the piano transients were improved by having the super tweeter sitting there on top of the LS6s. So yes, for the right type of buyer, maybe super tweeter curious, I would say the Aperion. <laughs> so yes, for the right type of buyer, the Aperion aluminum ribbon super tweeter Mark II might be, might be just the ticket might be. And with that, I can now say, I think it's time for the Audiophiliac viewer system of the day. Let's see what's up. This system comes to us from Roland. He's 53 years old. He lives in Stony Creek, Ontario, Canada. He says he loves audio, but he's reluctant to spend a lot of money for a system. But you know what? I think he's done pretty well. He calls it a simple living room system. The speakers are Tannoy Revolution DC4Ts. The amp is a Riga IO integrated. Turntable is a revolver, doesn't identify the model. CD player NAD C546BEE. And the DAC is a topping D30 with a RPI streamer running Volumio. Okay, <laughs> I think we've done it again. You know, this is getting to be a regular habit, this Audiophiliac viewer system of the day. I'm getting into the, into the groove of picking them, moderating them, tweaking the copy a little bit. It's getting to be a thing, yeah. It's catching on, this is good. Yeah, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you like what's going down here, please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. To do it, easy as pie, easy peasy. Hit the bell, or hit the bell, hit that button right down there. When you do, then you hit the bell, so you'll be notified every time there's an amazing new episode. Even if it's not amazing, you'll still be notified. After that, well, how could we follow that? Oh, you could check out the Patreon at P A T R E O N dot com slash audiophiliac. But while you're here, hey, uh, check out some playlists. There's a playlist for interviews right there. I hope you can see it. And if you can, click on that, you'll see oodles, oodles and oodles, dozens and dozens, maybe over 100 playlists of interviews with famous people, not famous people, just cool people, people who are audiophiles, pros in the industry, all sorts of interesting people. Uh, would I interview someone who isn't interesting? Well, that wouldn't make any sense. And there's also playlists for uh, speaker reviews, headphone reviews, electronics reviews, and even music reviews. Incredible, yeah. Anyway, I think I can now say, at last, my work here is complete. Thank you again for watching, and I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very, very soon. Bye-bye.